I have to say though, what possessed you to make an entire ritual system as a follow up for the first text? The Son of Chicken Cobbler is essentially a, an entire workbook with degrees and placements and people and how did that happen? Is it meant to be an, a real initiatic practice? Uh, I, well, uh, just to uh, start at the end and work for <laughs> work That's all for, right. Uh, yes, it's being done. It's being done all over the world. And uh, <laughs> the last, uh, uh, I think it's in, they're doing it in Finland. It uh, got translated. Uh, or the degrees got translated and um, uh, I've done it done it over a three day weekend in uh, uh, Sacramento just a couple years ago mm -hmm. with uh, 25 initiates and uh, I've done versions of it in uh, Nashville and uh, uh, yes the, the the book is written uh, uh, to be a handbook that anybody who would like to get together with a few friends and uh, uh, implant the Hebrew alphabet <laughs> <laughs> deep in their DNA uh, uh, to actually run this, uh, uh, it's like a little occult order. It is. Uh, no, it, it's it's fulfilled. I noticed you had a little title and everything. And it was I I was shocked when I saw it because I was like, wow, you know, because uh, I know you've written. Is it I think it's like 20 books over the course of the time that you've been writing. Uh, but that one was very striking, especially as a follow up to the original Chicken Cobbler. Um, well, here's I'll tell you the story, how it happened. Okay. And it, and it wasn't too long ago. I think it was in 2016. Uh, I've been going back and forth to China uh, from about 2014, uh, uh, doing uh, lectures uh, mostly on tarot, because tarot is kind of big in, in or is becoming big in, in China. So I've, I've gone to, uh, uh, first Singapore, not Singapore, but uh, Shanghai and then uh, uh, Hong Kong, and then Taipei, and then Beijing. And the Beijing, uh, uh, and these are all separate trips. And uh, the first uh, three-day weekend I did in, in Beijing, uh, it was on tarot and magic and, and a couple other things. And uh, on the way, my hosts, we're taking me to the airport in Beijing, uh, and uh, they they gave me as a gift to, right at the airport a beautiful new little MacBook Air. Uh, the I'm talking to you on it right now. Oh, okay, awesome. Okay, uh, and uh, they're, they're very generous and it's very nice and it's beautiful. I just love China. I'm sure I'm Chinese somewhere along the line. Uh, but uh, I was doing my uh, my talks on a cheap little Acer computer. Right. <laughs> and my host, uh, who is, uh, uh, or the brother of my host, who is uh, uh, a Buddhist, uh, sort of a facilitator does what I do only only is Buddhist uh, gave me this be beautiful new little computer and he says here take this holy men don't use acers <laughs> well he was right <laughs> <laughs> and then he said look can you come back three more times uh, now, can you come back four more times at the equinoxes and solstices mm -hmm. uh, and teach Kabbalah? And I immediately say to myself, no freaking way, man. You know, I don't know enough. 
I, it's hard enough teaching or talking Kabbalah with English speaking people who are, you're obliged to go into Hebrew and you're a bright, a, no, no way, you know, besides, I don't want to, I don't want to. <laughs> I'm lazy. Can't I just take my my new computer and go home? <laughs> but uh, they make me an incredible, uh, incredibly generous uh, offer. Mm. And I started to see I started to see in their sincerity uh, the, the fact that you know, well, if I've been asked to do this. I better figure out how to do it. So I said, okay. So I went back to Beijing every 90 days uh, on the equinoxes and solstices for three day uh, workshops. Uh, it was the same 12 individuals. We stayed at the same five star hotel in Beijing that meant that we could, uh, you know, have double ballroom size uh, space to work in all day. And we uh, had the capability and the facilities to have smaller meditational things even in the evening. So it was like boot camp at, right. a, at a very a very luxurious boot camp. <laughs> and um, so what I did, uh, when I went home and I started thinking about it, uh, and, and, you know, if I would have really tried to be smart about it, uh, it would have just not worked. Because I'm not smart. <laughs> but what I thought I should do is something very right hemispherish. And instead of going from uh, trying to take it from Chinese into English into Hebrew, I would just say, I would like to implant the essence, the meaning, the, 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 the power, the magic of the Hebrew alphabet inside the psychic bodies of these 12 people in a step-by-step -step way. So I'm going to invent an off-the-shelf temporary occult order using all the psychological tricks of the trade of, of Golden Dawn, OTO, Freemasonry, that, that in an initiatory environment, the candidate is in a sense allowing themselves to be stripped naked and then remolded mm -hmm. in the uh, with the dynamics of the degree involved. And so the, uh, the first time I came back, the first degree was the uh, three mother letters. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, uh, and that, I don't know if you got your- Oh, I can see that. Oh, you have a Yetzera box? Is yeah, there you go. Yeah. And this is part of the thing. Everybody, they, they build one of these and everything else. But that's, that's the first degree temple is that up, down, right, left, north, right. south. Okay. Those are the, the uh, three mother letters. And I did everything I could to make these people in an initiatory environment spring out of a blank black singularity and stretch themselves to infinite height and infinite depth and infinite east and infinite west and infinite north and infinite south well you utilize the full language of symbol that's what's so amazing about it is you you've 
taken away the necessary intelligible aspect and made it purely symbolic. And anyone could connect with that. There's no barrier there. And there's no language barrier either, or very little language barrier. Genius. Because, because they actually have to walk through the up, down, north, south, east, west. They have to actually have to do that. And then, then uh, uh, part of the, the, the meditative thing uh, is the, the projection of the Hebrew letter in its uh, classic queen scale color uh, and, uh, and then removing it to, uh, in other words, having it float around as, as the ghost image. Mm. Uh, and uh, the, the, the meditations are, are a process of uh, taking each of those letters also and uh, uh, the corresponding note, musical note, and there's an organ playing. You know? Yeah, I notice you have a musician space, which is why right. that's whenever I, when I saw that, and that's even in the first section, you know, the, the first practice has a musician spot. And I was like, it's very Masonic of you to do that, you know, because that's kind of our thing. I feel like you, you might have stolen this. No, I'm playing, I'm playing. But but it is it was still very interesting and uh, yeah I and then the, and then the, the when I when I then they had ninety days to work on a study program mm -hmm. and to make their own things to live literally embody there's nothing that uh, well I won't say that but but they lived and breathed for ninety days the three mother letters. Mm -hmm. Okay, there wasn't any, they didn't have to memorize anything after 90 days. They had their Aleph Mem Sheen, they had it covered. Right. <laughs> and they have handshake, we've got handshake. <laughs> and, uh, you know, secret signs that, that all refer back to the mysteries of Aleph Mem Sheen. And uh, so in order for the, when I came back six or uh, 90 days later, uh, in order to penetrate the new temple for the new degree, they had to prove up. And so it's a step-by-step -step expansion of consciousness, just like in uh, uh, Golden Dawn or, uh, or in a lesser degree, Masonry. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the next one is the seven double letters. Right. So it's the mystery of duality now. And, and uh, 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 you can see that... Uh, uh, it, it's a degeneration of creation from the singularity into the, the dimensional thing, which is not only space, but movement in space creates time. And now we're, we're really getting low to the, you know, the planetary uh, spheres. Right. And uh, the, the fact that now we're getting so low in the consciousness uh, realm that there's duality. We actually think there's a bad against the good. <laughs> and, right, right. And war against the peace. Oh, God. Oh, but here it is. And it's, so we did. I just want to say, it's funny that we began this conversation with your delve into Sefer Yetzirah. And now we are again, whether people realize it or not, rediscussing Sefer Yetzirah and, and a usage of it. To, to essentially make th this entire expression to to symbolize it in, in an experiential way for other people and that's just i mean I, I read the book but i didn't know that people were going about engaging in it and, and i didn't know the full philosophy behind it it's, it's really interesting well like everything else I, I didn't plan on making a book out of it okay mm -hmm. i just took a year of my life <laughs> for my 12 chinese friends you know <laughs> And, uh, and of course, the third one is the 12 uh, uh, simple letters. Right, and right. The zodiacal thing, which is a real thing. And, uh, and for that, the, instead of the cube, there's a dodecahedron. Yeah. Okay. And uh, inside the dodecahedron is the cube. And I'm inside... And inside the cube is the three mother letters. 
three mother letters. It's it's really it, it's so cool because I mean I was talking earlier about how I make my own stuff, which I do. I tend to make these meditative imageries, uh, typically Kabbalistic in nature. Yet, that's actually a teaching tool. Like you could really show that to someone. You know, meditative imagery can be as well, but it's a little different in how it engages with the human brain, and in a way you've really made manifest. A, a learning instrument, you know, that it itself can be looked at and analyzed and people can almost experience this, which also thank you for showing it, by the way. I think it's phenomenal. Uh, I just, I don't know. Again, coming back to it, the reason I wanted to do this talk in the first place is because I do feel that this is a phenomenal learning moment for many people. And I know we've talked about Chicken Cobbler and Son of Chicken Cobbler. I, I suppose I'd like to ask you something a little more personal. And I don't mean personal in an odd way. No, don't be nervous. Don't be nervous. <laughs> it's not that bad. Uh, what is it about Thelema that has brought you to this point? You know, I, you've given us a little bit of a history about this, but what for you personally, just in your life, not even just dealing with the books themselves, what is it about Thelema that has, has shifted your paradigm and your worldview in a way? Uh, what, what caused your mutation? so to say the you know the, the the central core of Thelema is that there is no law beyond do what thou wilt uh, and uh, and that doesn't mean or at least for me it doesn't mean you know do whatever you want <laughs> I hope not <laughs> yeah uh, uh, because I, I don't know what I want <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the the idea that uh, there is uh, a pretty a pretty good sound uh, body of literature uh, coming out of c coming out of uh, 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 Crowley and his and his work. Mm -hmm it's it's not all great and it's not all uh, 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 relative to me at, at least yet mm -hmm. but a great deal of it is uh, I'm, I'm very very uh, uh, comfortable with the fact that it puts the entire responsibility for your spiritual evolution on yourself and I agree with that yeah, yeah. and, and uh, so the I like the idea that no two people that uh, consider themselves Thelemites uh, agree with each other on everything. Well, hang on. You do know the joke of, of the Hebrew people, right? This Let's is, hear it. If you put two Jews in a room, you get three opinions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I like that, okay? <laughs> uh, but uh, from the culture that I came out of, uh, especially the 10 years I spent uh, growing up in Nebraska, uh, where the, the willful ignorance is so thick you can cut it. <laughs> that that uh, it was very liberating uh to uh come across uh, somebody like crowley who uh who spoke with a great deal of uh uh knowledge and wisdom mm -hmm. uh, on the th on the things that had uh, uh stimulated me in the uh in the 60s uh, uh he, he spoke with great uh, uh knowledge and familiarity with eastern mysticism uh, and uh, uh i was particularly uh impressed at the time with uh, and still am with uh, uh alan watts and uh oh yeah uh between alan watts and timothy leary uh, and a uh, man who would later be La Ram Das, Dr. Alpert, 
uh, and Alistair Crowley, all of a sudden I said, these are luminaries in Western luminaries here that I could get drunk with. <laughs> <laughs> You'd want to get drunk with them. Yeah, you know, it's, it's different. Want to get drunk with these guys, uh, you know. <laughs> I think they'd like getting drunk with me, you know? <laughs> and uh, that, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, and I don't want to sound overly mystical about the, about the whole thing, but almost from the moment that I heard the name Aleister Crowley, uh, I, I was fascinated with, uh, uh, any bits of information that was attached to attached to his name, and the fact that uh, uh, I started to get into very basic elements of Kabbalah with uh, BOTA, the builders of the Adytum. Wait, were you and, in BOTA? Yes, I yes. didn't know that. Okay, uh, I would recommend their their preliminary uh, uh, tarot course and their preliminary Kabbalah course uh, to anyone who's interested in Western uh, application of uh, of uh, this stuff. They right. don't like, they don't like Crowley, but you, you know, they can't be perfect. Right. <laughs> Nobody's it, perfect. It actually, it contextually makes so much more sense now because Boda is very developmental in Yetzera from this like practical Western perspective. I really, yeah. it make it, it, it clicks, you know, to, to realize that. And I, I, I really enjoyed the correspondence course. I, there, I wasn't involved in a proneos or anything like that, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, I was friends with BOTA uh, national officers uh, who were also interested in, at the time, were interested in Crowley too. Uh, so the... And when uh, I met uh, Regardi and uh, Phyllis and, and Grady, mm -hmm. I actually, uh, Regardi was just as charming as a human being could possibly be. And, you know, you'd have to be a fool not to want to grow up to be just like him. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and Phyllis and uh, Phyllis uh, and and Grady were uh, uh, they they were married at the time and they divorced just almost as soon as uh. I yeah. uh, but anyway they were they were wonderful people and uh, we were we were close friends with Helen Parsons Smith uh, she visited us many times. Mm -hmm. Uh, and she was the the wife of Jack Parsons. Oh from... no, I I know. Uh, well, okay. I guess for the viewers, they may not know. Sorry. Um, well, he was a rocket scientist. Yeah, he he actually invented the fuel, right? That was yeah. used, right? There's uh, a crater on the moon named after him. Yeah, at, and a very impressive fellow. And didn't he? He died early, though, right? Is that Jack Parsons, or am I thinking of? Yeah. Was, yeah. Well, uh, he he was blown up. It's unfortunate. Yeah, uh, but anyway, it was a spectacular way to go. I mean, gee whiz, uh, it went know, out with a bang, a real bang. It, it looks good on your resume, you know. <laughs> Did he die on the toilet? No, he blew up half of Pasadena. Uh, <laughs> but anyway. And and Helen was she was also uh, married to Wilfred Smith, who, who was uh, uh, the lodge master of Agape Lodge OTO in uh, Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is in the 30s and 40s, in the early 50s. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, these are people that are. Uh, uh, a person would not mind being considered contemporaries of, uh, in the same way as, gee, if you were alive in the twenties, wouldn't you, 
wouldn't you want to hung out in Paris with, with, uh, you know, the Hemingway and Dali and, you know, right. you know they're all crazy as loons, you know, <laughs> but, but, you know, they're crazy like me. I like it, you know, so, <laughs> but anyway, so that's that. And, um, and of course, when at the, at the time you don't think, uh, or you don't think very much, or you don't allow yourself to think very much that that, uh, gee, these are historic characters. I'm I'm you know bumping elbows with people responsible for uh, at least small explosions. Uh, mutations of human consciousness. Well, I would suspect you don't know it in the moment, right? I, I think that's yeah. one of the impressive things about this type of experience is you don't yeah. see it when it's happening. It's always later. And then you look back on it and you're like, wow, yeah, that was a big deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, that's that. The, the chicken Kabbalah uh, degree ceremonies are... Uh, uh are being performed uh the only thing i when people uh write me to ask you know permission to do it or ask my blessing for them to do it mm. uh, i just tell them what uh what the rabbi the rabbi told them in a fictitious letter uh, i don't know if your your listeners know but I made up the rabbi. I what? made up. What? Ravi Lamin Ben Clifford's not real? I thought he was on the East Coast right now. Oh, oh he's real. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it's funny because uh, when I first wrote uh, the book on uh, tarot ceremonial magic, which has a lot of Kabbalistic. Uh, uh, talk in it you know i never presumed to speak with any authority on on you know orthodox kabbalah well uh, it's it's unfortunate to say but you did <laughs> i'm just kidding no, and you well, did you did great work in order to do that i had to make up my own rabbi to quote okay <laughs> and, but um uh, uh, if I could find it here, I'd love to. I'd love to quote it. Uh, okay, can I? Can I read? Uh, of okay. course, of course. Uh, here, here's a supposed carbon copy of an undated letter to a local organizer. Somebody's getting ready to do this. Dear friend and comrade, I hate organized clubs cults and anything that smacks of profit motivation and hierarchical ego trips. If we're going to do this in your city, here's how it's got to be. We exist as an initiatory entity only for the hours of the degree ceremonies themselves. There shall be no dues, no fees, no oaths of obedience, no loyalty oaths, no oaths of secrecy, no tests, no exams, no business meetings, no newsletters, no gossip, no BS. <laughs> the officers for the initiation ceremonies are you, me, and a musician. A musician technician to play a few organ notes and run a simple slideshow. Be prepared to personally shoulder all financial responsibility. You may, however, graciously accept voluntary assistance in any form. Mm. I'll send you the scripts and materials. You book my flights, the hotel, and make all arrangements. Then don't worry about it. <laughs> I like the throwback. Because, I mean, this is... Uh, Chicken Cobbler came out in, like, what, 2000, 2001 or something? Uh, a little later than that, I... I yeah, 2001. Right, okay. And then and this entire working that you developed was, you know, far later. You even mentioned that its its real genesis was like 2016. 
Yeah. It's just really interesting to know that there's so many years of, of like lapsed time where other things were going on. And I know you wrote other works, but it's still for this particular subject. It's just interesting that it, it had such an impact on people. I, I think that's something that we don't realize, you know, again, kind of mentioning that we don't see things aside from in the moment or, or after the fact, I should say. Uh, we don't see the role that we play in other people's developments at that exact point. I, th I think you can witness a mutation using your terminology. You can witness it. And it's quite all striking, but the the grand scheme, the the big picture that it plays, is far more elaborate. And, mm. and I think we can agree with that. Uh, which is why I'm just very happy that you talked about these things with me, particularly these books and. And also the, the historical aspects of your experiences and everything is, is really illuminating to the entire piece as a whole, you know, not saying you should ever write uh, what is it, an autobiography of your experience in occultism. Don't be afraid to do that if it ever possesses you much like these other works have. Well, I've got two books like that. Uh a very old book called My Life with the Spirits mm -hmm. and uh, a book called Homemade Magic and Homemade Magic is going into a new edition and those are sort of autobiographical in nature but to tell you the truth everything that's, I write is autobiographical. I was about to say that's also what I want to hear. <laughs> I want to hear some truth. I can't uh, Nothing makes sense to me uh, unless I can apply it to the experiences of my own existence. Mm. And so the the easiest way for me to to compute uh, to, to communicate uh, concepts is by by sharing how at least at one point in space time. Uh, that uh, that concept applied to me and how I interpreted uh, interpreted it. So it's easier for me to um, explain, say, the dynamics of uh, what spirit evocation is is really about, uh, and what it isn't, what it is, and what it isn't. Uh, by giving example of the first evocation that that I ever did, not knowing what any of it was, how the, the, the operation blew up in my face, or how the operation blew up in my face and then, but worked. <laughs> okay. uh, and the illustration of the dynamics of just a simple narrative uh, communicates to the to the listener or the the reader what all the technical aspects of the of the situation are. I don't have to go into great a great deal of detail by saying you must reach deep into the your, the nepish. <laughs> with, your, with your locking orders, you know, to, um, from your auxiliary, you know, authority. Uh, <laughs> no, just tell the freaking story, you know. Right. Yeah. Uh, the demon burned my eyes, you know, but I burned my eyes because I was so stupid. I put the goddamn oil on my eyes. Ah, oh, shit. You know, and. Uh, and the reader figures it out themselves. They, they have a whole story. I mean, you don't listen to, and I'm not comp comparing myself to Homer, but y y you're not dissecting every aspect of, the, uh, of Ulysses. <laughs> uh, oh, what's he doing with, oh, he turned them, she turned the men into pigs. And oh, uh, yeah. You know, you're just getting the story in, okay? And the story is ringing your bells in, in the way that only your bells can ring. Mm -hmm. And that's so much that's so much better than trying to to uh, uh, 
explain it as a textbook uh, using a, a admittedly arbitrary and inadequate vocabulary of terms. Uh, just how does this happen to a person? And if you were in that position, what would that mean? What would that mean for you? And so that's that's the easiest way for me to, to compute, uh, communicate any of this stuff is uh, in an anecdotal narrative. Right. Hmm. Well, then I guess uh, because I know I don't want to keep you all day, obviously. I could if I really wanted to, but I don't want to do that to you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's not fair. So I, I guess I will ask you this. Based on the earliest points that we had in this discussion, please summon up all your laziness to provide the most brief, immediate idea. What do you believe that all people stepping to the occult need to know? If you could, if you could be absolutely lazy, and lazy is an answer. I just figured that out. Uh, <laughs> what would you bring to the table? Uh, that at the same time, Everything you perceive is a direct communication of God to your soul, and it's funny. I like it. Spoken like a Kabbalist. <laughs> well, Mr. Duquette, thank you so much for being on. Uh, I am going to keep watching your videos on Facebook because they're really good. I love your readings. I love your descriptions. And I really just like the implements that you show. You know, I, the the Yetzera box, the, the dodecahedron, all of these items that... <laughs> It's it's so interesting, you know, and it's I think it's what many people aspire to one day also do, and they just have to do it. So, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for having me on, and thanks for thinking of me. Of course. Well, have a wonderful day, all right? Thanks a lot.